Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll get started. Um, before I, my opening remarks, just a little reminder for those of you with cell phones to put them on mute. It's a classic, right? And there has to be a phone that rings during a presentation. So welcome to FASCON's 14th consecutive mining series. My name is Frank Mariage. I am a part, I'm part of the FASCON Global Mining Group. I'm also a partner from our Montreal office. Today's webinar, The Future of Workplace Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiatives, is the ninth in our series of 14 seminars this year. A calendar of all our FASCON's PDAC events can be found, uh, it says underneath the video screen, but for those of you who are, I guess, who are on the web. And please refer to the slide on your screen for some housekeeping items, again, for those of you who are on the web. Before we begin, I would like <clears throat> to provide a land acknowledgement. At FASCIN, we have embarked on a journey of reconciliation guided by our Reconciliation Action Plan. As part of this journey, we believe it is important to acknowledge the land and the people who have called this land home since time immemorial. Today in Toronto, where the PDAC conference is being held, we are gathered on territory that has been the home of many nations, including, and I will do my utmost best to pronounce it right, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations. Toronto is also covered by Treaty 13, signed by the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Chippewa. We appreciate living and working here and recognize the importance of working to advance reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people here and across Canada. Now, I will turn it over to my colleague, Sandeep Tatla, the moderator for today's session, and who will introduce today's panel. Sandeep, over to you. Great. Thank you, Frank. Uh, welcome, everyone who's joined us in the room today and online. As Frank mentioned, I'm Sandeep Tatla. I'm uh, the Chief Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer here at FASCIN. My focus at the firm is to work with the leadership to develop and implement a strategy uh, to address systemic barriers to equity and solidify the firm's uh, culture of inclusion so that diversity thrives here. Um, I'm joined today uh, by a wonderful panel who also coincidentally happens to be all women. Um, quite fitting as uh, on Friday we mark International Women's Day. So in the room with me today, we have Lisa Marcuzzi, who is the Vice President and Head of Corporate Affairs, Legal, Diversity and Inclusion, and ESG, at our seller, Metal DeFasco. And we have Alina Polinskaya, who is the Global Leader of Corn Ferries Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Consulting Practice online and uh, on the screen for those of us in the room. We have um, Pillar Thompson Thomas, who's an energy, environment, and natural resource partner at Quarles and Brady. Um, she's based in Tucson, Arizona. And last but not least, uh, my colleague joining us from our South African uh, Johannesburg office is Daphne Willem, who's a partner in our labor, employment, and human rights group. Thank you all of you for joining us and I will give you an opportunity to introduce yourselves in a moment, but I did want to set the stage a little bit for this conversation that we're going to have. So back in 2020, we saw what seemed to be a rise in social consciousness around diversity and inclusion. Many organizations at that time amplified their commitments. Uh, we saw them double down on their diversity efforts, and we saw a rise in diversity officer roles and EDI teams. Just a few years later, now in 2024, we're confronting, um, I'd say, a pivotal moment in our ongoing pursuit of uh, inclusive workplaces um, in the face of changing attitudes, growing polarization, and evolving legal landscapes, which seem in some jurisdictions to be curtailing um, diversity initiatives. For example, we recently saw in the US the Supreme Court decisions uh, that impact diversity and inclusion efforts 
including efforts that have limited um, affirmative action and LGBTQ2 plus rights. These decisions have sparked debates and raised concerns about the continued promotion of diversity um, initiatives across various organizations. Additionally, we've seen legislative efforts aimed at restricting diversity training, um, further eroding diversity efforts. For those companies that are global, so sorry, for global companies who may be headquartered in the US or have significant operations in the US, uh, this has definitely drawn uh, some question, drawn into question their diversity initiatives. And this also undoubtedly spills into the efforts of those of us who may be operating in other jurisdictions. But the question is, what, what about the factors that initially drove um, our heightened expectations around, around diversity? What about the business case for diversity? What about the expectations of millennials and Gen Zs? Um, and then there are jurisdictions, which we'll hear today, that have actually doubled down on their efforts for diversity. How do we reconcile this growing gap? In this global context, it's imperative that we approach the discussion about workplace diversity with nuance and sensitivity. Our panelists today bring diverse perspectives and expertise to the table. I encourage those of you online and in the room to engage in this critical dialogue. We have opportunity, we will have opportunities for questions towards the end of the panel. Um, so, you know, we're looking forward to that. So turning now to the panelists, uh, I'd like to start with, I said that we've got a diverse panel, so I'd love for um, our panelists to share a little bit about their backgrounds and their organizations. I'll start online with um, with Pillar, if that's, that's, we can start there. Yeah, first of all, good morning and thanks for having me. It's gonna be about 70 degrees and sunny today in Tucson, Arizona, so I don't know what the weather's like uh, where you guys are, but I'm certainly enjoying this beautiful sunny weather. Uh, my name is Pilar Thomas. I'm a partner at the firm of Corals and Brady. We're a semi-national, I like to say, we're, we're across the country based out of Milwaukee. I'm based out of the Tucson office where I practice primarily in the area of tribal energy, economic development, natural resource development. The firm represents, in addition to tribes and tribal enterprises, uh, a handful of mining uh, companies and other renewable energy uh, developers who work across the country uh, on uh, mining, especially in America, where we're trying to onshore, re-onshore clean energy, um, our clean energy ecosystem. So um, critical mineral mining is is happening here. A lot more Arizona is kind of at the heart of it. A lot of lithium and copper uh, uh, in the West. And so a lot of work being done both by our clients and uh, both mining clients and tribal clients around trying to take advantage of this new clean energy ecosystem. So thanks again for having me. Thanks, Pilar. Daphne, we'll move on to you. Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Daphne Willem. I am a partner in um, the Lear department in Festland's Johannesburg office. Um, Primarily, I do employment work, um, but one of the practice areas I focus on in South Africa is empowerment. So I advise a number of companies um, based in South Africa in multinationals that have a presence in South Africa with compliance, really with the transformation laws in South Africa, which include the triple B E codes, the mining charter, the Employment Equity Act, which is one of the acts I'll focus on today. And transformation is not really limited to um, workplaces, but also extends to economic participation, the allocation and ownership of mining rights and licenses in South Africa. So I will do the, the advisory from beginning up until even implementing some of the, the measures to ensure compliance with, with these transformation laws. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Um, Lisa? Hi, my name's Lisa Marcuse, and I am a daughter. I am a sister. I am a twin. I am an executive. 
my pronouns are she and her. I'm a volunteer board member. I'm a single mom. I'm a lawyer. I'm a zia, which is um, Italian for aunt. And my current employment is head of corporate affairs, legal, diversity, and inclusion at ArcelorMittal DeFasco. And I'm also the regional general counsel for Canada for ArcelorMittal, the leading steel and mining company um, in the world with approximately 154,000 employees. In Canada, we have developed a full value chain from iron ore mining to the development and manufacture of um, unfinished and finished steel products for the automotive industry, construction industry, energy industry, and commercial and industrial packaging industry. And in Canada, we have about 10,000 employees. I'm thankful for Faskins inviting me here and grateful, be, grateful to participate in the conversation. Thanks, Lisa. Alina? Hello, everyone. Alina Polanskaya. I'm a senior client partner with Corn Ferry, and I lead Corn Ferry's global diversity, equity, inclusion consulting practice. I know many people know Corn Ferry as an executive search or search firm. We do have uh, a broader capabilities around advisory, and we're really helping our clients to unleash the potential of individuals, organizations, and teams. Um, the DNI uh, consulting practice has been working with multiple clients across different sectors, and I'm looking forward to the discussion, sharing what we're hearing, the concerns and opportunities, and also to hear from you what's working, what's not working, and really looking forward to that, to the discussion today. Thanks, Selena. I'm actually going to start back with you. Given, um, one, the global scope of your role and the fact that you're working with clients across uh, various industries, what have you seen and observed with this? You know, I've set the sort of framework for what we're starting to see um, in terms of the shift in EDI. Um, would love your perspective on what you're seeing. Yes, I mean, I think the situation is rather complex and complicated. Um, I think for a lot of a lot of organizations, global and regional, but there's one pattern that we see across, across different countries, across different regions, across different sectors. And the pattern is increased um, societal and political polarization. And this pattern is actually very, <clears throat> very concerning. If you are uh, following World Economic Forum, every year they release a global risk report. This report this year was released in January, and so they've surveyed more than 1,000 um, global leaders, subject matter experts, in terms of what are the major risks that we are facing in, you know, in the corporate world and beyond. <clears throat> and societal and political polarization was identified by all these leaders and experts as one of the top three risks. Today, in the next two years, and one of the top nine risks, um, yeah, 10 years from now. And the societal polarization is kind of on the equal footing with economic downturn and is a root cause and a driver of many other global risks that we are facing as societies and organizations. That polarization is eating us alive and it prevents us from moving forward and solving major challenges that we are facing as you know, business and societies. The wars, the global wars that are going on, the war in Ukraine, um, Israel and Gaza, they're adding fire to this polarization. The political polarization in the United States is also a major factor that we unfortunately cannot ignore. What's going on in the United States is affecting a lot of other countries. And with the election coming up, um, some of the DNI challenges are really used for you know some of this um, the political gains, which is unfortunate. The education field has been the battlefield for that polarization. I think this is what Sandeep just mentioned: um, the Supreme Court uh, decision about banning the race-based affirmative action. A lot of um, going on at the state level, LGBTQ community and so on. I think um, 
you know, for the corporations, though, corporations are watching what's going on and they're trying to understand what are the risks for us. Right? As we are working with our uh, customers and employees and communities. And so um, I think a lot of the companies are kind of falling into the three categories that we see. Some of them are, you know, maybe never really been into the transportive DNI uh, uh, strategies and actions, and they're cutting back. So that's definitely going on. They're cutting back on investments, on uh, resources, and, and so on. But I would say this is a smaller proportion of, of clients that we see doing this. The, um, the bigger proportion of uh, clients and organizations are just kind of, you know, keeping lights on and they're waiting and seeing. But there's one group of clients that are really accelerating. They don't see the night going anywhere. You know, the customers are diverse, employees are diverse, communities are diverse. We need to know how to navigate this complexity and tap into the collective intelligence of all that diversity to solve the business challenges. And this is very exciting. And I think we all can, can learn in terms of what these companies are doing um, so that we can accelerate the progress together. Thanks, Selena. And I know hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about what those companies are actually doing. But before that, I actually wanted to pick up on what Alina was talking about with the specific backlash in the US and the polarization we're seeing. Um, and Lisa, I wanted to pick that up with you. You, you know, you talked about your organization being global and then having a large footprint, at least here in Canada as well. What are you seeing from the Canadian context, from your perspective? And then are you seeing any of what's happening in the US or more globally impacting the broader organization or even your work? Um, I'll, I'll speak from our company perspective initially. So, um, you know, we remain committed to ED&I um, and to the work that needs to be done under our ED&I strategic plan. It aligns with our company values and our company strategy. For us at ArcelorMittal DeFasco, it's not are we going to do it or not, it's rather how we're going to do it. Um, you know, our tagline at DeFasco is our product is steel, our strength is people. And, and we do know that people is our competitive edge. Um, at the heart of our strategy is our commitment to providing a workplace that is safe and inclusive. It's an environment where everybody can bring their whole self to work, where everybody is allowed the opportunity to thrive both personally and professionally, and where everybody that comes on to our workplace in that plant feels welcomed, valued, respected, and heard. Now, with that said, we can't ignore the, what's happening, the backlash. We can't ignore it. Our leadership knows we can't ignore it. But they also know that we can't be successful in business without an ed &I commitment and strategy. So um, rather than being reactive, what we're doing is being purposeful in how we're responding. And by being purposeful, what we're trying to do is to counter the misunderstanding about ED&I with a direction towards understanding why ED&I is important. To understanding that we need to respect one another's differences, that we need to be aware of um, inequities, and that we need to counter the biases, much like you said, why it all started, why ED&I has become like a practice area. Those biases that are hindering everybody having equal opportunities to survive, or to thrive, I should say. Um, we're committed to learning, and with learning, you have to adapt. We are committed to building awareness and understanding of equity issues, and we're resetting our uh, behaviors. So to have change, you need to have intent, you need to have commitment. It's a lot of hard work. It's about awareness, continued learning, and action. So at a steel mill in Hamilton, Ontario, in the last few years, we have followed our parent company 
and we are committed to doubling the percentage of women in leadership by 2030. Each of our leaders has EDI goals and their performance objectives. We've launched five inclusion and belonging networks, or ERGs, employee resource groups. We have DNI champions, about 40 across the plant. We have a women's, an indigenous, a pride, and a black employees network. Further, what we've been focused on is the development of inclusive leadership. In the, you know, we will and we continue to um, measure, set goals, measure them, and report on them on all the initiatives to building an inclusive workplace. So, where, what are we doing globally? At Arsler Middle, it's also focused on the how, not the yes or the no. It's on the how, and people is one of our five strategic uh, priorities. We believe and know that one of the important impacts for a successful team in an um, a global environment is a team with diverse perspectives. Um, in the last few years, they've established a DNI Council, Global DNI Council. Uh, they've hired DNI professionals. They've made a commitment to double the uh, percentage of women in leadership management or supplemental management positions by 2030. And we've hired an external consultant to do DNI assessment globally. We've taken those results and now are benchmarking and using best practices across the globe with our Slimital DeFasco leading many of those benchmark practices. So we know there's hard work to do. And I do know many steel companies, many mining companies that are following suit. I can talk to the Canadians and the Americans as well. You know, what have I seen more of? I've seen more questions about, does this mean we're going to stop? You know, the Canadians are watching what's going on in the US, so we do hear a lot of questions about that and how we are dealing with it. And as I've explained, we're focusing on countering those misunderstandings by building awareness and understanding of the importance of ED&I. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Pillar, I'm going to move to you. You're our one U.S. panelist. Um, so, you know, given your specific focus working with Indigenous groups, um, what have you heard on this polarization? Like, are you seeing that impacting the work that's happening with, uh, you know, the, the, the tribes that you're working with um, in your practice? Yes. So, well, a couple of things to keep in mind, at least with respect to tribal communities and tribal members of those communities. Uh, tribes come at most of this with a political lens on. So they're interacting with federal governments, state governments, local governments as governments. And so it, it's a the government to government relationship that the tribes have with other governments in the United States um, and, and sometimes around the world, but frankly, just limited to the United States, is an important underpinning of how tribes view uh, some of the DEI activities. On the other hand, folks who are partnering with tribes and working with tribes or engaging with tribes um, don't necessarily, at least the non-governmental actors, don't necessarily view their relationship. Certainly it's not a government to government relationship, but it's an acknowledgement that tribes are sovereign governments with sovereign rights and authorities, um, very similar to federal or state uh, approaches. I think with respect to um, folks who practice in our my area of practice, you know, I think it's it's incredibly important to recognize that many of our clients continue to look for um, a strong diversity effort uh, at our firm, and especially tribal clients or folks who hire us to do work with tribes. They they want to make sure that they are engaging lawyers uh, and a firm that has a strong. Uh, emphasis on a diverse uh, legal uh, team, uh, folks who bring not just uh, um, 
diversity in background, diversity in law school, diversity in thought, frankly, uh, as well for us. And many of my clients, especially our, our mining clients, are looking, and our renewable energy clients, to a certain extent, um, are looking for that kind of diversity because they know they're dealing with it in the work that they do. Uh, and certainly on the, the interaction, again, with tribes, uh, 574 federally recognized tribes. I'm only a member of one. So uh, while, while I can, for the most part, speak to my tribe, you know, we certainly do have uh, a little bit of a reliance on uh, on native lawyers who have experience in working in Indian country, both from a um, from a community perspective and and the back particular background of that community, uh, from a cultural perspective, uh, and then from a political or governmental perspective. So our our emphasis around diversity tends to be focused around a, a kind of those host of of areas that you're interacting with tribes on. Yeah, that, that's very interesting because it's like you've echoed some of what we heard from Alina and Lisa around the the the, the expectation is still there, um, and it seems like it's coming through from your mining clients specifically in understanding the importance of being able to engage, you know, with the tribal communities in sort of an authentic way, and and we've seen that actually last year in our our EDI session for PDAC we you know, there was this focus on moving and, you know, in Canada, we specifically have this duty to consult and how, you know, that duty is important, but that a lot of mining clients and organizations are actually understanding how that meaningful consultation actually yields to more significant business uh, benefits for the company are you are you seeing some that similar approach in the in the u.s i yes especially from mining most of the mining folks uh, and frankly most of my mining clients are uh from canada so so uh the the mining folks in america tend to be international uh and and there's there's a stark difference quite frankly between the companies that we represent that are international in nature, at least in my experience, international versus just de purely domestic companies. So what we're starting to see now, and I speak about this pretty regularly uh, at conferences, is a lot of learning from our neighbors to the north, uh, uh, the Canadians as they interact with First Nations, uh, up there, we're starting to see a little bit more to the south into Central America, South America, um, and and some of the efforts that we see in, in mining and clean energy development down there. I know there's tends to be more of a international effort around this. The domestic companies are starting to get uh, the 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 memo, so to speak, and sometimes because that's driven by federal policy. So as an example, if you if you want to get a loan or a grant from the Department of Energy, uh, you now have to have a community benefits engagement plan and agreement. And when you're dealing with tribes, if you're in an area where you're going to be implicating tribes or tribal interests or tribal resources, uh, they have to be included in your CBA. So domestic companies are now uh, being uh, routed into, uh, well, I think in Canada, you refer to it as the IBAs, the Impact Benefit Agreements. And those are very common in my, in, again, in my mining clients, I'm helping them, I'm helping several negotiate. Um, well, they, everybody's got a different name for them now, but I'll call them IBAs. So everybody's negotiating those now with tribes that are in their footprint or whose resources might be in their footprint. And that's a standard practice for the Canadian companies that I work with. It's not so standard for the domestic companies. So that's something they're learning, something I'm helping them uh, understand that there's benefit there. Uh, and so, uh, and again, they're uh, from a certain perspective, uh, the DOE, if they're trying to get DOE money, federal money, they're being uh, pushed into that into that aspect of community engagement uh, as well. So it's starting to take a little bit more root here 
uh, in the United States. Uh, and again, it's being fed mostly by international companies who are here and now uh, federal agency requirements. Great, thanks. I'm gonna just shift gears slightly and, and move to Daphne to talk a little bit about the South African context. Um, and, you know, are you seeing the polarization and are you seeing a similar pushback uh, in South Africa? Um, so there is, there is a pushback um, in respect of ETI initiatives in South Africa, but it is actually coming from um, the South African government, particularly the Department of Employment and Labor. And the pushback is really in respect of um, designated employers' inability to implement EDI initiatives effectively to ensure that their workplaces are transformed or are equitably representative of the demographics of the country. So currently, the Employment Equity Act, which is the act that regulates employment equity in workplaces or the transformation of workplace compositions, require employers or designated employers to implement affirmative action measures that are aimed at um, addressing any employment equity barriers that employees would have identified um, that go to the heart of equity, inclusion, and even diversity of the workplace. In addition to those affirmative action measures, employers are required to set their own numerical goals and targets, again, aimed at ensuring that the workplace is diverse. But they, the Department of Labor and Employment have done a survey of um, the composition of workplaces for the past 20 years since the, the enactment of the Employment Equity Act. And I found that there's no there's slow progress towards transforming the composition of workplaces. Um, and this is has well, this has been accounted for um, the the discretion given to employers. So the pushback from the department has been that they want to take away the employer's discretion in respect of the numerical goals and impose sectoral targets on employers. So we're seeing a shift from a self-regulated affirmative action um, regime or employment equity regime to one that is statutory regulated, where the department will now set targets that employers need to comply with, designated employers, I must emphasize, must comply with, and failure to do so would then attract um, fines um, if there are no reasonable grounds for, for, um, for failing to comply. So the, the South African context or EDI in South Africa, is com it's slightly different in that the focus is um, placed on your obligation to comply, um, where previously it would be you have a discretion to comply um, in a certain way that you deem appropriate for your organization. So really interesting. So it's a pushback, but a pushback in the opposite direction of... Yes. Uh, pushing for more diversity. Um, yes. Yeah, fascinating. So, and I, I'm sure there, you know, like if you're a global organization and you're in this global context and you've got certain jurisdictions where there's um, legislation that's pushing back one way, but then you've got, you know, other jurisdictions in which you operate that are pushing other ways. Um, you know, and I think we've talked about this a little, there is broader business implications to doing this work other than legislation demanding one thing or the other. Um, and I wanted to just sort of hone into that. What are the actual benefits? Like why, why have we been talking about diversity in, in the context, you know, not just since 2020, but, you know, for the last many years about why is it so uh, important that businesses adopt this? Um, I wanted to focus on that. So we've got the implications. We've heard about the changing landscape. But what what is it that drives companies um, that maybe we haven't mentioned yet to actually focus? So I'm going to start with Alina around the talent piece. You know, there's there is this big piece around this work that's driven by meeting the expectations of of diverse talent. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Yes, of course. Um, and 
I mean, I think the compliance elements are important, right? And companies need to recognize what they are, what level of risk they're willing to take, and how they're going to manage this. But I agree. Uh, everything we know from the research and the practice is that the diverse teams that are inclusively managed, they outperform homogeneous teams. And I think this is where the strongest business case for diversity lies. It's really at the team level where you get to that superior performance. For some reason, in our DNI efforts in the past, we, ten we tended to overlook teams. We would focus on the pipeline, right? we would focus on supply, which is important, but the teams generate demand for this diversity, is recognizing the differences that you need that will make a difference in solving business challenges that you know will ultimately lead to this insights greater um, decision making uh, greater innovation and so i think these are the opportunities and companies that are pulling away in in north america in particular from the united states these are the the opportunity risk that they encounter they are reducing their talent pool you know particularly um, with younger generation we know that they're looking for commitment to diversity equity inclusion sustainability they're looking for flexible work and if the companies are not providing this their talent pool shrinks that's not a great strategy um, there's also employer branding Right. If you if you were all you know anti-racist three years ago and now you pull in your way, you're inconsistent. It takes away trust, it erodes your employer brand. It's very difficult to earn this trust back. It will take years. Um, you know, I think these are you know some of the really major um, uh, trends and and opportunities that companies are addressing. Another one is certainly workforce engagement. So we see engagement scores going down with companies that are inconsistent or not delivering on their commitments. That is not also a, a great way to motivate and drive your workforce forward. Um, so I think these are some of the opportunity areas that we definitely see. And I think some of the emerging ones is actually, which is related to that opportunity to team and activate the collective intelligence, is the opportunity of co-creating, putting your diverse by design teams to work on specific business challenges and really getting to those breakthroughs. And we see some of the, some of the leading companies, they're not focused on DNA from the HR perspective, but they're really partnering with businesses and they are putting those teams to solve intractable business challenges and they're getting some really you know tangible results so just building on what alina said lisa are you on a like product client side seeing uh or how are you talking to your stakeholders about the benefits of diversity first of all that i agreed with everything you said it was really well said i want to copy it <laughs> um, yes, like we're seeing it heads or tails every which way, north, south, east, west. Um, you know, we, like many successful companies, recognize that EDI is a corporate priority. Our employees, our prospective employees, community partners, governments, and industry certifications are holding us accountable. They're watching what we are doing. Um, all the ESG reporting that we must do, um, reporting out to employees, reporting out to shareholders and investors. Um, Pilar mentioned uh, government funding and what's required there. That's in all of the Canadian um, and, and provincial, various provincial um, fundings that companies are getting have reporting obligations as well. Um, in the industry certifications, they all contain KPIs or measurements that we need to report on that are EDI related. Um, and that's because they recognize they have value. You know, if, um, for example, as a subsidiary of an EU, a European Union based company, um, we have to comply with CSRD, uh, the beautiful corporate sustainability reporting directive thousands of KPIs. 
When I look at what we, the Canadian subsidiary, have to report on, along with our other Canadian affiliates, you can just look at our HR KPIs. We will be reporting on employee gender, employee um, ableness, um, Indigenous employees, the numbers. From a community perspective, we also need to be reporting on our community engagement, community investments, community grievances. Um, we've recently received responsible steel certification for DeFasco, and we have many of our affiliates that hold the same certification around the world. Um, many mining industries are trying to be IRMA certified as well. And those certifications require um, reporting out on EDI related um, KPIs to maintain your certification. Um, you know, it's also the EDI strategies and responsible sourcing. So, we, like our customers, are working to improving our responsible business practices, including responsible sourcing. So, that requires um, an inclusive supply chain and vendor. Uh, diversity. Um, in our industry, mining steel, uh, there's significant focus on gender parity. You know, increasing the number of women and non-binary people in um, skilled trades, in engineering, and retaining them. Not only recruiting them, but retaining them in employee engagement. And I won't repeat what you so eloquently said. I would say that I was going to say it exactly the way you were going to say it when I was talking about employees, but I won't. Um, we've also signed on to the Canadian federal government's 5030 challenge. For those of you that don't know what that is, is it's the Canadian government has asked um, companies, Canadian companies, to um, work towards gender parity, 50% women um, and non-binary people on their boards and in senior management, and significant representation, 30% um, of other um, equity-deserving groups on our boards and in our senior management. Um, so pulling back on EDI, <laughs> it's just not an option for us. It would jeopardize not only our business, but our reputation. And our, the EDI work that we are doing is critical and crucial to us being an employee, an employer of choice, a supplier of choice, a good corporate citizen or community partner. And frankly, it supports our license to operate. Thank you. Uh, Daphne or Pillar, do you have anything to add in terms of you know, what you're seeing or other risks of pulling back? the efforts that organizations have embarked on? Um, so I, I'll just um, piggyback on what Lisa said about um, a license to operate. So um, pulling back on EDI initiatives in South Africa may affect companies' ability to, 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 co to continue to operate in South Africa or have consequence or may rather have consequences on their ability to continue to operate in South Africa. And the reason I say this is because um, certain EDI initiatives form the basis or contribute towards um, an entity's compliance with the triple B E codes. And um, for example, a diverse work workforce um, and ex um, training initiatives, skills development programs, socioeconomic um, and inclusion programs and inclusive procurement process as an example. All of those are some of the factors that are considered when determining a company's triple B status level in South Africa. And we know in South Africa that status level is crucial. Um, the lower it is, the more attractive it is um, to entities that are doing business directly with the state or indirectly with the state. And it is that contributor status level that makes your company very attractive to grow business and to get more work in South Africa. So a pulling back on or pulling back on EDI initiatives may ultimately affect the shareholder in respect of return of investments, because then your, your business or the bottom line in your company is then affected. Um, the other thing is transformation um, really other than BEE drives um, customer engagement. Your customers will you will be attractive to your customers, and even 
to other employees. Um, so it's it, there is severe con- or there may be rather severe consequences on on companies who are pulling back on those initiatives in South Africa. Let me maybe add just quickly from a slightly different perspective. So I also teach Indian energy law at the two law schools here in Arizona, University of Arizona, Arizona State. Uh, And I serve on the nonprofit board for um, the Foundation for Natural Resources and Energy Law. And one of the kind of critical aspects I see that um, kind of stepping away from or dialing back DEI initiatives uh, for me has to do with bringing younger uh, students of color into this space of practice. Uh, There are, at least in the legal practice, uh, it tends to be older and uh, whiter and maler. <laughs> more men, more white men, more old white men. Um, and, and of course, as that, as that generation starts to retire, um, what are we filling those needs, those, especially those legal needs with? But all aspects of mining or energy d- development, et cetera. And so I kind of also look at it as a the more – companies pulled back from this um, less about their license to practice because that's um, you know kind of the social contract aspect of this at least here in America um, as opposed to a, a, a legal requirement aspect of this uh, but I also look at it from well how are we going to attract younger law students younger engineers um, how are we going to attract kids into these professions uh, both for for uh, diversification of of employment and and uh, employee population, uh, but for diversification of economic participation in this part of the economy. So, uh, so I also see the pullback here in America as being one that um, can discourage young students of getting into these spaces of, of doing this kind of legal practice or doing this kind of engineering work. Um, if they feel that, you know, their, their diversity and what they might, their different perspective, what might that bring to the table, if they don't feel like that's going to be valued, then we're going to have a real challenge with getting young kids, uh, to start replacing the folks who are all retiring or dying off as the case may be. Yeah, and I, I think you're bang on on that. And then I think it, tying it back to Alina's, if you don't have the diversity within the organization, you're not going to get that innovation um, and that performance, that heightened performance um, that we know the data has clearly shown. Okay, so we've, I think, established, you know, that there's a lot of risks to pulling back, but I think we've also established that a lot of organizations are not actually pulling back, right? That they're, um, you know, that they're continuing uh, the work. Um, That still begs the question, because Alina, you opened up with, you know, the top risk identified by the World Economic Forum was this polarization, right? Um, and, you know, you don't have to look very far other than sort of opening the newspaper um, or reading, you know, any business sort of magazine, which talks, you know, EDI seems to be all over, all over those magazines in the news. Um, so how, if organizations know that they need to continue this work, how do you navigate this space? So, you know, do we keep doing what we're doing? Do we do things differently? What is that different? And I'm going to just start with Lisa because you you talked about that a little bit in your opening that you've had to do some explaining, some level setting. Um, would love to hear what you what you're doing because you're you're not pulling back. Yeah, I'm repeating myself, but we will remain committed to our EDNI strategy and the initiatives that we've identified for building a diverse and inclusive workforce. Um, We're going to remain people-focused. We're going to remain focused on valuing different perspectives, um, sensitive to the opinions and the values, the perspectives of others. Um, So 
like other business strategies, uh, factors come in that impact the way we deliver on our strategies. So we have had to pause, and that is pause, not stop or abandon. We've had to pause some of our initiatives in order to bring our employees along um, and um, you know, to build the awareness and the understanding. Whether that's how it all fits in within our organization, whether or not we need to change the words that we're using, uh, the messaging that we are giving. I know um, Sandeep and I have had a discussion, you know, talked about doubling the percentage of women in leadership. Um, and we, we did get feedback from employees across the board trying to understand what that meant. Was that, uh, so none of the men are going to get opportunities from the women saying, you are putting a focus on us and you are undermining how we're moving up in the organization because they think we're just moving up because we're women. And so it was going back and starting as to why and to, to how you challenge biases into creating opportunities and the like. Um, you know, we've also had to bring a lot of initiatives forward We've had them in our strategic planning, but because of demands from our stakeholders, we've brought them a year ahead and whatnot. Um, so nothing stagnant in EDI and I work. Um, just looking at the last three years, the events globally and regionally have elevated a focus on uh, social discourse, um, inequities, injustices. These events have not caused us um, to stray from our commitments and our strategy. That remains constant. That remains our focus. Um, and while um, we're going to remain to be responsive and not reactive, and while others are being reactive, what we are doing is we're learning, we're listening, and as a result, um, we're responding with best practices. And uh, we get to benefit uh, from learning from around the globe, our, from our affiliates and from our key business partners, suppliers and customers alike. Alina, um, what have you seen? What, what is the opportunity here for us? I'm gonna be a little bit provocative. Okay, we're ready for it. <laughs> I think we can continue doing the night work that we've been doing it um, because we've been doing the same things over and over again. We've been using the same toolkits, the same methods. Part of the backlash, if we put the kind of, you know, the political side of it, there are a few things we can learn from that feedback. It's feedback to all of us. One piece of the feedback is that the DNI programs or initiatives, they're not delivering tangible results. We can be more outcome based and we should be. And I think that's one thing that we can do better. The other piece of feedback that we are getting is that the DNI work, not, not the intent, but how it's been done. It's been done in a polarized way as well. Is being blaming, shaming us versus them. And we need to bring together our collective power. We need to learn again how to collaborate and how to work across differences. And that's how we're going to reduce that polarization. We have to learn how to work together again, valuing differences, bringing those differences to the table. You know, collaboration, not to say that, oh, we're just going to all align you know, in authoritative way, or we're gonna all, you know, do the kumbaya. No, it's, we have specific challenges. Let's put our, you know, let's work on this together. Let's collaborate, let's team up. And I think these are the things that we could do better. And, you know, we can also broaden the spectrum of differences that we are looking at. You know, when we look at gender, we look at women, Men have unique needs as well. We can't leave them out. I mean, if you look at the data, in particular for the working class in the United States, there's such a phenomenon as death of despair. And it's primarily, uh, you know, touching the uh, male, uh, men, uh, working class, mid midlife. Um, 
their health is jeopardized and we can't leave people out because that's why we're experiencing that backlash. We need to bring everyone along, not leaving anyone out. And I think that's what we need to do differently. And I think that's an opportunity and it will all be better as a result of it. So I just want to dig down a bit deeper on how do we bring people together, right? There's, and it, it, it there's been over the last number of years, there's been this piece around dialogue and that we need to have more dialogue with each other to better understand each other and that this dialogue is what's going to bring us together. Um, what I'm hearing from you is a little different. It's not dialogue for dialogue's sake, if, what if I heard you correctly, but what you're saying is we should be focused on tasks yes. together. Yes. I, Did I, I get that right? Yeah, I actually yeah. have very strong okay. <laughs> opinion on this um, because I think we had a lot of dialogues for the sake of having dialogues and it's not as much as it's important, you know, to have, but there is a point after which those dialogues become a matter of ideology, political views and so on, and they're not really leading to anything constructive. And I think the way to bring us together, we need to align what are we trying to achieve? You know, what is that intractable challenges that we have in our organizations? Let's anchor our conversation and dialogue around this specific purpose. We're here for a purpose. So in order to achieve this intractable business challenge, what kind of differences we need to have at the table that will be critical for us to solve that? You know, I bet you a lot of the big six will be there. There will be additional differences. And then we have a conversation of how we collaborate and work in the context of that challenge the context what makes us grounded and allows for you know productive uh, conversation with the goal of working together activating collective intelligence putting our collective action forward yeah i would ask if any of the other panelists have any thoughts on on that or if you've seen that come to life in any way um so it's unfortunate that my, my my whole talk has been based on um, the legislative um, provisions in South Africa that govern EDI or employment equity. But the issue about dialogue or the point about dialogue is something that is um, that is addressed by the particular Employment Equity Act that um, I've been speaking about today. And one of the things is um, or one of the, the, the forums that the, the Act creates is called an Employment Equity Forum, where employers and employee representatives meet around the table to discuss any employment equity barriers that employees have identified. And those barriers could be um, barriers to equal training opportunities in the workplace, um, barriers to um, entry into the workplace, promotion of women, um, in the workplace. So they, they focus particularly on issues that inhibit career progression of people from designated groups. So that particular group that was previously disadvantaged. And it is in those forum meetings that there's a consultation, consultation between the employer and the employer representatives to identify the actual measures that can be put in place to deal with the issues that have been um that have been identified. So it's not just consultation or, or dialogue in, in a vacuum. Um, as Alina says, it's focused on addressing a particular issue and it can even be outcome-based because you then want to work towards achieving a particular um, issue or resolving a particular issue as part of your dialogue. So in South Africa, that, that dialogue is there um, and it's it's particularly prescribed by the Act for employers and employees to engage in. Sorry, did you have something to add, Lisa? Uh, I, I agreed with what you said. It's difficult to figure out how to implement it. And so we even struggle with how we move forward um, at, at work. And, you know, I do think we have so many people missing from the conversations, as you've said. So I do think that one of the things is, is that we need to measure and we need to share our results 
good or bad, and then have those people there helping us try and figure out why we aren't necessarily succeeding in one area or the other. Um, I do think a big part of it is um, just continuing to learn and to understand, and it, it needs to broaden who's at the table. You know, I can't speak on, I, you know, I've only lived in Canada. I'm a white woman. I can only speak from my perspective and not understanding. So you have to figure out how to bring people into the conversation. And, and it, it can't just be a conversation. They're part of the solution. They're part of the reward when we do do it. They need the recognition. Uh, when I look at it from an employer point of view, um, one of the, um, I have a fantastic um, DNI manager that joined our company a couple of years ago, just coming up on two years, and she brought forward storytelling. And for us, the storytelling was a way to open up the doors to build the understanding. Because, you know, there's a lot of fear. And I feel like people ask me, what's the barrier? I think the barrier is fear fear of doing the wrong thing, fear of being the person that's up front and doing it the first time. So when I look at it from an employment point of view, if we can bring those conversations, they're genuine, they're sharing, um, it, 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 it will help. But I completely agree with what you've said. We've been doing this a long time and we're still not. Uh, I think I forgot to tell everybody I'm a lawyer and an attorney. I'm an alumni of Faskins, but... You know, um, the number of years we talked about women lawyers and what we were doing, and the needle really hasn't moved a ton. It's the same. Yeah, and so I, I think I also, Alina, if I understood you to the dialogue, obviously it would be around some of the barriers that exist, but I guess, you know, it'd be interesting to get a tangible example. Like if we're working on... I don't know, can you get, like, I'm the way I understood, and tell me if I'm wrong, and I, the way I understood it, what you said, is if you and I and some other people were tasked with designing, I don't know, a new widget that does something, right? And so, um, and so let's say we're asked to design a new glass. You're saying in that design, our focus is the design, of the glass, yeah. right? But in order to overcome, like if I don't feel safe voicing my opinion in front of you, that there's a problem, right? And so in the actual act team, we've got to figure out how to create that safety. Um, and then also if I'm afraid because of, or, or maybe there's, hierarchical um, power. issues, power, right? Yeah. This is the word I'm looking for that might prevent me from sharing a story of maybe even how I use the glass, right? We all assume we all use the glass the same way, but maybe from my cultural context, mm -hmm. I use the glass in a very different way that yeah. no one would know unless you're from that culture. Yeah. Um, but I've got to be able to bring that forward and share that. Is, is that how, that's how I understood when you said it? That, that's very much so. And I love that you use the word design, like as, as an example, you're saying we're designing something. And I think that the whole element around designing is an important one. And this is the toolkit that we've actually been missing in the DNI space. We are designers, you know, we talk about being intentional about diversity, inclusion and equity. And that intentionality comes from the early stages when we are planning, when we're thinking, you know, about creating something. And that's where a lot of, you know, if we don't, if we're not intentional, if we're not thoughtful, we are creating potential inequities that affect others. And we've seen this a lot, you know, with, with products like in the, in the healthcare sector, the medical devices, the pulse oximeter, you know, that during COVID wasn't reading darker skin patients. And so that was something that, you know, was designed by people um, at some point. And um, there were some people missing during that design stage that were not challenging, you know, who are the patients we're testing this on? You know, what is the, you know, what are the applications? And so I, 
I think that's exactly that. It's identifying the challenges or specific, you know, business objectives we're trying to achieve together. Figuring out what is the right team that needs to work on this. And moving forward with the project. And as we are moving forward with the project, with a task or mission, we're also working through our difference as a team. So we're learning in the flow of work. We're creating an environment where the power dynamic can be managed. We're coaching the team. We're, co we're creating a psychological safe environment where we can have those conversations, we can challenge it. That's how we practice it. So it becomes real, right? It becomes tangible. It's not just a conversation that is more about viewpoints and, and ideology. And that is, I think, a very tangible way to do that. We are working with a number of organizations that are doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. So they are identifying intractable challenges. It could be related to talent. It could be around product development. It could be um, you know, some market strategies and growth in specific countries. And then we're helping them to put the right team together to tackle that business challenge that goes through the process of what we call inclusive design. It's actually that methodology was um, started here in Canada by Yuta Trevoranos, who founded the Inclusive Design Center. And so it's very hands-on. And the, the, the group is then going through that process while also learning inclusive leadership and what it means to be inclusive teams. Mm -hmm. And we've seen, we run a number of experiments with clients actually to see the outcomes of this, of this process, of this work. And it's incredibly to see the, what these teams are able to produce. We're also measuring team dynamic. You know, are they getting along? Is it, you know, the, uh, how's the, the team climate? Is it polarized? It's a, it's a much more tangible way of, you know, of doing this work. Um, so, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. And you said a lot in when you said you were going to be controversial because you also said the language you're using and there is a question about that, which I'd like to put out to the group um, from our audience online. Um, and the question is, I'm wondering if the language used for EDI initiatives would benefit from a change in our way, uh, in the way they are described. Um, so I don't know if any of you have come across that. I know, Daphne, in your context, it's a bit difficult because it's legislated. Um, but maybe even Pillar, if you've noticed just in your general practice when you're approaching clients, if you change the language and the approach that you've seen different outcomes uh, around some of these topics. Or I'm not going to put it, it, you know, if you have yeah, something, so, I don't want to put you on the spot. I mean, I think, I mean, you know, it, well, here uh, we like a lot of short letters because, you know, we're all a texting um, uh, society now. So if you can't reduce it down to 144 characters um, and some short letters like LOL or whatever the rest of them mean. Um, so I think people get wedded certainly to um, short memes that help them remember. And that's the challenge now that we've got folks trained on DEI um, to change it. It's like ESG and everyone only pays attention to the S and not the E and the G. Uh, and so that gets other folks uh, kind of riled up about the social engineering that's involved as they see it in ESG. So from a from a, I think from a client perspective and from a both um, mining company developer tribal, um, as I said, for you know for the most part in Indian country, it's not really thinking of it as a DEI effort, but from an employee law firm, law, uh, law, lawyer, and law student perspective, uh, that's still a phrase that, that matters. Um, language, uh, to a certain extent, I think from where I sit and the work I do, there are certain terms, I call them the banners under which, for example, tribes uh, really push uh, the certain ideological viewpoints around governance, sovereignty, for example, the government-to-government -government relationship. Uh, and, and as those 
as people try and kind of redefine that, it, we tend to revert back to what we remember the most. So I don't know if changing DEI is going to make any difference. Um, maybe a rebranding will help. Maybe not. I think the key to the point points being made uh, earlier, the key is to keep the conversation going, however we call it. Uh, if we have, you know, goals that we're trying to achieve around um, um, innovation, access to different ways of thinking, access to people with different experiences, um, and incorporating all of that into the work that we do, the clients that we're trying to service, the lawyers we're trying to attract into our firm or into the space that we work in, um, it seems that, you know, maybe DEI is outlet, it, you know, it's get tied well out here. It's a little crazier in America, but, um, or at least in some States in America, uh, which poses the other challenge I think for us, uh, here is that we don't, we don't really have, uh, a more uniform approach, which is maybe a good thing. Uh, but I digress with, sorry, I digress. I do think language is important, but actions speak louder than words. So the more we can act on what we're trying to accomplish, however we want to say it, um, you know, I think that's, that's what people see how you act, what your results are, and what the benefit of your results are. And, and many times, you know, they don't really care how you got there. Yeah, the, and I'll give you guys an opportunity to talk about what I thought was quite fascinating the way that you framed that was, all the language you used is the business language that we use every day in organizations. And, you know, nowhere did you say, like you said, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, but you said is maybe you shouldn't be called that, but you, everything you talked about in terms of how we frame it are, is language that we use every day as we're, as we're actually um, executing on other things. And so that was a, great takeaway anyway for me to think about that, right? How do we, why, why do we always have to call it diversity? Like why, why not just focus on, do you have the diverse perspectives around the room? Do you, are you deliver, what are you delivering on? What are the outcomes? And I'm not going to articulate it as well as you because I didn't have a pen to write it all down, but I thought, you know, you can frame some of what we're trying to achieve um, with diversity, equity, and inclusion without maybe always using those words. And maybe that's for the interim where we need to go with some of this if there is this polarization happening. Not sure, so don't quote me on that, but I, I did like what I heard from you and it seems to align with what Alina was saying. Anybody else have any thoughts on that question about the language? I have a little story. Um, you know, Increasing women lawyers, increasing women engineers, increasing skilled trades. And uh, we have a road show at um, DeFasco and you go out into the plant and we were standing there and uh, in, in a pulpit in the mill and uh, a group of us was like, what is this ED&I? And there was someone who was, I think he was probably a year from retirement. He's like, this is nothing new. This is about putting people first. This is about being an organization that we've always been about making sure that we are our brother's keeper, which we, we've tried to change to other's keeper, safe and everything. And I thought kudos to him because he was able to articulate it quite quickly that it's not necessarily something new. It's just something we need to do better. And because of the way things are changing, we're being very purposeful in the way we're doing it. But that words did matter. And for him, it was, it's not about us increasing women here at DeFasco. It's not just about that. This is about the whole thing about making sure everybody who comes to work each day feels that they're welcomed and comfortable and safe. And that was one of my still producers there, our steel workers, who said it. Yeah, that's great. Is there any questions in the room while I'm taking some questions? I just wanted to add to Lisa's point. First of all, I'm Rosario Estubilca. I'm on the board of PDAC. Um, I've been three years on the board. I just got reelected for three more years. So I'm here and part of the convention. 
um, and I worked in the mining sector. Uh, I actually grew up in the mining sector. Uh, but anyway, what you said, Lisa, is really important. You know, people first. This is not about the numbers. This is not about one against each other. The groups we and I, we're learning a lot about what's happening now. It's about working together. And in my experience, the work with Advance, at least with the PDAC, it didn't start in the EDI committee. We have one. It start actually in the sessions with all the directors working with each other on, the, on objectives, on fo focusing on tasks. And rather than seeing the differences, focusing on an objective and how we can get along and make better decisions. So I think that's the important part. And I think uh, I'm hopeful that we'll learn and, and do more, more action and advance really in this matter. It is very important for the business and for all of us, right? Uh, and especially in a sector that uh, you know had the issues about attraction, uh, issues about reputation and trust, something you also mentioned, Alina, very important, uh, not only with the people, the workers, uh, but the communities where we do the work, right? Um, but anyway, I just wanted to add that, and thank you so much for putting this together. Thank you, thanks for sharing your feedback. Any other questions? I have a few others that I can go to, but I wanted to check in the room. No, any, I don't see any coming in online. Okay, actually, so this, this is a good one. Um, we had it before, but it, it aligns around the misconceptions and the feedback that you said we as diversity professionals or those of us working in the space need to hear. What, from each of your perspectives, is one of the biggest misconceptions about this work? that needs to be addressed? I don't know if it needs to be addressed, but I think I've already said it, is that everybody thinks it's new. And I don't think it is new. Yeah, this is Pilar, I, I agree. I mean, I before I became a lawyer, I worked in financial services and the corporation I worked for based out of Chicago started a diversity initiative in the early 90s. Um, that's how old I am. So I, I've been working on diversity initiative efforts uh, since then and all across the board, corporations, I've worked for on, on diversity efforts in the federal government, um, both at, at Department of Justice and Department of Energy, where uh, you, you don't have a very diverse group of lawyers or um, energy people. So, um, and now, in the firms that I work in. And I think it does boil down to just ensuring that uh, you have the folks that you need to do the work that you need to do for the clients or customers uh, that you're doing it for. And uh, I think there's been, at least in my experience, a recognition that it's important from not just an internal workforce perspective, uh, federal government doesn't try and make money, but it does service citizens. And uh, they have, uh, my experience has been that everybody's concerned about making sure that their customer, their clients, their stakeholders um, are well represented and, and getting the best product that they can from the organization. And, and it all boils down to that. And I think it, it's part and parcel with expanding um corporate influence or um, achieving, again, desired results. Uh, and, and at least in my experience, it's always been tied to uh, this is not only best for our customers, our clients, and our employees, but it's best for the company itself. And that's not certainly an old, uh, a new idea. Thank you for that. Um, Daphne or Alina, any, what do you think the biggest misconception? Um, one is that d and work is done uh, by d and professionals. That is not true. d and work is done by leaders, by business leaders. d and professionals are there to, to help, to consult, but it's a, it's a work of leadership. It's a work of inclusive leadership. And I think we just sometimes forget that. So I think that's one. Um, the other one is, DNI work seems to be, we perceive it as it's about 
women, it's about people of color, it's about an LGBTQ, but it's about all of us. And yes, it is about women, and yes, it is about people of color, and it is about the LGBTQ community, but it's also about all of us in all our intersectional identities. We are complex human beings, and the work is about all of us working together. There's no such thing as a diverse person. Diversity comes when there's more than one. Right? It's a collective, it's a collective notion. And I think we, it's important that we remember that. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for saying that. <laughs> Taking notes. <laughs> um, I agree with Alina. Um, the, the biggest misconception is that um, here in, in South Africa, HR would be responsible for running the whole process of ensuring that the company complies with its um, statutory obligations or any commitments that it's made. But it really go boils down to every single person in the organization. It needs to trickle down from leadership all the way down to your most junior employee because everybody creates an inclusive working environment. It's not just one particular person, but it's everybody working together. So for my last question, I think what's become clear is that this is an interesting time and there's some real opportunity here or around this work and perhaps reshaping it, reframing it, um, maybe not doing the same thing over and over again. So we're at this interesting juncture when it comes to this work. What piece of advice do you have for those who are in the room or online around what they can do um, to navigate right now? Who would like to go first? It's a big question. I can go. Okay. I know you'll have ideas. I was ready. <laughs> um, going back to where we started, uh, which is polarization, I think we should all be really worried about this. Um, it's not good. It's not going to get us anywhere um, on anything. Um, and I think the the way so there's lots of things that we can do in terms of reduce, and part of it is refocusing ourselves on collaboration and teaming. And also, I think, just remember one thing uh, that I think we forget. And the thing is interdependency. We are all interdependent. We are all part of that complex you know, web. And we need to remember that. Uh, and, and I think if we anchor ourselves on interdependency, we will operate from a different space. Sir. I'm avoiding eye contact, I'm thinking. <laughs> you know, I do get a lot of questions from our leaders. Um, and the big thing is that they don't want to make a mistake. They're afraid. And um, then I can give them, you know, a mile or a kilometer long list of all the mistakes I've made. I think... Um, if, you know, we need to have action, we need to do something. So I think the advice I give is to be genuine and um, you will make mistakes. So know that you will make mistakes. And when you do make mistakes, you need to own them, learn from them, apologize gen with gen genuine statements and feelings. Um, and the other thing, too, is there's always someone there that's probably been there, done that, or could, could help and to reach out. So I guess the advice is don't be afraid. And uh, there isn't a mistake that maybe you can't come back from. I'm sure someone will tell me I'm wrong on that. But genuinely, um, if you work with good intents of being an inclusive leader and person um, and learning. Yeah, I mean, I love that you've said because I think in this environment, and I've talked to other EDI leaders about this, there is this paralysis that's going on because people don't know where to go and are not sure what to do because they don't want to make a mistake. And so I think leaning into some of the attributes around authenticity and inclusive leadership 
are important right now and remembering that there may be some mistakes along the way as we navigate this unchartered um, territory that we're in. Uh, going to my panelists online, um, Daphne, any any thoughts? Um, so my piece of advice would be um, that um, companies look at EDI initiatives more as a, a moral commitment that they make and not really focus, particularly in South Africa, on the statutory obligations. But it is something that the company would like to do um, to better its um, its working environment, to ensure that it is inclusive, to ensure that the working environment is diverse. And in those instances, even if there is a change, um, like we are anticipating in South Africa, um, a change in the legislative um, framework, the commitment remains the commitment that the company has made to ensure that it becomes inclusive and it is aware of um, the shortcomings that um, are happening around it, but it has committed itself to achieve whatever commitment it has it has made to ensure diversity, inclusion, and and equity in its in its working environment. So more internalized than really based on any external issues or, or external legislative provisions. Okay. Pilar, any? Um last pieces of advice on how to navigate this time that we're in? Yeah. Well, um, just keep at it. It's one thing I tell my, my law students, uh, it's just been my experience that uh, there's always troughs in what we do. Uh, thankfully, I guess to a certain extent, history is not linear, um, but it does uh, have a, a bias towards progress and, and progression and things getting better. And I think we just have to keep at it. Um, it's I, I usually uh, end um, conferences or speeches that I give to tribal leaders with a quote from, from Will Rogers, who's a famous satirist here in America in the early 1900s, a member of the Cherokee Nation, and he had a saying that what's the point of being on the right track if all you're doing is sitting there? So it's one of the things I try and, and um, help my clients think through, even when it's not when it's looking rough and tough, and uh, we got to get from here to there. You got to just keep moving, and I think that's it, it. This may be a period of time where it's hard. It's it, you know people are attacking it for no good reason or for their purpose, uh, selfish reasons. Um, but as long as we keep moving and, and even if it's a little bit at a time, or even if we have to take a bit of a pause while the dust settles, cause we're not sure what direction we're headed in. Uh, I think that's maybe simplistic, but, um, but I think in a, in an important effort to just keep at it. Thank you for that. I think that was, um, a really good way to sort of close it off. I don't think I can articulate that better. I think the quote that you shared um, is the right one, right? You can't be on the right track if you're just standing still. And I probably butchered the quote, but we get the sentiment. So with that, I just wanted to thank all the panelists for joining us today. Um, I feel like there's so much more to unpack on this topic and it'll be, con it'll, uh, be one that we continue to learn on. And I think that's the great stuff about this space is that there is great opportunity to learn and learn from each other. So I hope to be in conversation with all of you again soon. Um, for all of the rest of us in the room and online, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, and I'll share that our next PDAC session will be taking place in uh, two short hours at 4 p.m. Eastern um, and we'll be um, it'll be the 14th annual Latin American Mining Update, Why It's So Hard to Crack the Rock, Dispatches from LATAM. Um, you can sign up for any of our upcoming webinars through our virtual calendar or by visiting FASCAN Institute section on FASCAN.com. Thank you, and we hope you can join us for our next session. Thank you.